Hello, everyone. Welcome to the August 2015 Professor Messer Security Plus Study Group. This is our monthly study group where I make some questions up, I put them on the internet, and then we all answer them and see how we did. We are able to do this thanks to your support of what we do here. It's a lot going on at Professor Messer these days. And if you want to keep track of what's going on, you can always see what's happening. You can, of course, uh, look at the existing Security Plus course if you want to purchase one and take it offline at professormesser.com slash getsecplus. Of course, I've got tweets and YouTubes and even vouchers for 10% off of your CompTIA exam. Don't pay full price for your voucher. I've got a discount already for you thanks to my friends at GTS Learning. It's at professormesser.com slash vouchers. As I mentioned, my course can be taken offline. Every single minute of every single video of my Security Plus course is all online to watch for absolutely free. But I recognize there's some people who can't be online all the time, or you would like an offline version, maybe one with MP3 files that you could listen to. And of course, I include my course notes. We'll talk about the course notes later on. All of this can be purchased from my website at professormesser.com slash getsec plus. But today, we're here to answer questions. And I have these questions available to you. All you need to do is pop open a new browser window and go to Socrative.com, click the green student login button, and go to the room name Professor Messer. Make sure you spell it right, or you will be in a chat room or in a, a Socrative room with nothing going on. It will tell you the teacher hasn't really started anything yet. This has been running for about 15 minutes now. For those of you that, that are in there, you'll be able to see things like this where you can answer the question that's there. And the question currently is, how long have you been studying for your Security Plus certification? And some of you are already starting to answer that. There are also apps available for your mobile device, whether you're running iOS or Android or Windows Phone. There's also one for Chrome, inside the Chrome browser as well. And if you are in there, you'll see a question, how long have you been studying for your Security Plus certification? And you'll be able to answer that question as well. You can see 56% of us so far, 57% have said less than three months, 20% uh, three to six months. And then a lot of us are taking a long time. If you're like me, you take over a year to get through a single certification. Now, you may already have your Security Plus certification. And later on in this presentation in the first hour, I'll give you a special key, a special code that you can email to me. And I'll send you a digital certification back saying you must have watched this because you knew the special code. And that will get you one CEU towards the renewal of your Security Plus if that's how you plan on renewing your Security Plus. I guess that's a whole other set of questions that could come up. Got a lot of questions this week for some reason about the Security Plus certification. And when is it going to expire? Well, the, the question that people ask me is when is it going to expire? And then I have to ask, are you asking about your certification and when your certification expires or when the exam will be retired, which are two completely different things? Most people are saying that uh, the the piece that is important is they want to know when the exam's going away. Well, it just got here in April of 2014. So it has only been around for a year or so. So we have another couple of years before you would even think of seeing a new version of the Security Plus exam, which is exactly what CompTIA has on their Security Plus page on their website. Um, so you'll probably be even to take, able to take the exam for approximately six months or so after that if everything proves the way it has gone in the past, which means you could be very close to 2014, 15, 16, 17, almost 2018 before this exam goes away. So definitely uh, think about if you're planning to get a Cer Security Plus certification, take it now. In fact, you should just take any certification whenever you need to take it. Don't worry about when a certification is going to be retired. There will always be an overlap. And the Security Plus certification that you take today will be the exact same one that you can get whenever you pass a later exam, if that happens years into the future. Uh, it's a 90-minute exam. You could get up to 90 questions. And we see people that get a range of different questions. But it's usually pretty close to 90. It's a passing score 750 on a scale from 100 to 900, which is a little bit weird, I understand. So, and we believe that each question is worth a different amount. So you really can't put a percentage on it either. So there must be a good reason to do that, right? So that makes perfect sense to me. And it is a both a multiple choice exam 
And there are performance-based questions. So you might get a question that's not just A, B, C, or D. You have to put things in a particular order. You have to match things that are on the screen. So that may be an important thing to keep in mind. There's a great video that CompTIA created that explains the multiple choice, the fill in the blank, the matching, the command line, all of the different things you could be prompted with for the Security Plus exam. Let's answer some questions, though. That's why you're here. Let's go through and see if we can answer some of these. My first question to you is dealing with keys. And the first one is really which of these would be an example of out of band key exchange? If you think you know the answer, do not answer in the chat room. Don't Google it. Stop Googling things. You should, of course, go to Socrative.com into the room name Professor Messer, and you should see if you know what the answer is without checking in to Google or anyone else in the chat room. Is it that instant messages, uh, out of band key exchange is an instant message over an encrypted connection? Would it be encrypted with a private key and transmitted via email? Would it be verbally discussed and verified over a conference call speakerphone? Would it be the hash of a key sent over a VPN tunnel? Or would it be stored with a hash on a secure HTTPS page? It's got to be one of these. One of these is going to be an example of out-of-band key exchange. And really, there's only one example here. So lock in your answer if you think you know what the answer is. Go to Socrative.com to the room name Professor Messer. Make sure you spell it right. Or you're not going to be able to see anything going on there. Like they say in the chat room, my Socrative's not working. It says the teacher's not there yet. That means you're in the wrong room. You want to log out or, or change your, your room that you happen to be in to the correct name. It's right there at the bottom, Professor Messer. Make sure you type it right, and you will be able to get in there and answer this question. Let's see how we did with this one. This was how one that we just sort of jumped into right off to see what the particular answer might be. We've had a few of you already answer this. So let's see how we did. Oh, we're all over the place. We're sort of mixed as to what this one might be. We can see that 33%. If we went with the one that has the most right now, 31%, say verbally discussed and verified over a conference call speakerphone. But very close to it at 24% is hash or like a key sent over a VPN tunnel. And 21% would be encrypted with a private key and transmitted via email. And then we've got 13%, the other two options that are there. This is actually a pretty important consideration when you're working with encryption keys. The, the keys themselves are the most important thing. At least the private key or the key that is used to encrypt the information is obviously something that needs to remain secret. So it's very common to transfer the key between two different locations or two different people or two different entities. It's very important to do that sometimes outside the scope of the network because you're never quite sure if somebody might be listening in to what's going on across the network. And of course, you want to think about ways to do this that would be out of band. And what that means is that we're doing it outside the scope of the network. We don't want anything to be in band, which is in the network stream. We want to be outside of the network stream. So a good example of an out of band key exchange would be something like a telephone call, because it would be unlikely, unless, of course, you're doing voice over IP on your network, probably not a telephone call. Pick up your mobile phone for something like that. You, you could have a courier put it into a document, seal it up so that nobody else can see that, give it to a courier, have it couriered to the other person or sent to the other person, and then they can check the seal when it arrives or in person. You show up, we're going to do this face to face in a secure area. I'm going to give you the key, and now we'll be able to communicate securely across the network. This is a little bit different than the in band key exchange, but if I had not pressed the wrong button, you'd be able to see that a little better. There we go, in band key exchange, where it's actually on the network. Usually when you're doing an in-band key exchange, you're adding additional encryption to it to send it across the network. We very often do this when we're going to a website and we need to go to the website to purchase something. So it's HTTPS. We will take the symmetric key that normally goes back and forth and we'll encrypt it with a public-private key pair and then send that across the network and then decrypt it on the other side. So there is a little bit 
of extra things that we can do if we're going in band. But of course, in band, we're never sure who's in the middle. We're worried about this out of band connectivity. So when we start looking at what the different options might be, or which one of these might be an example of out of band key exchange, instant message over an encrypted connection, although it is encrypted, it is still in band. So it would not be A. The other 11% stored with a hash on a secure HTTPS page. And again, a hash doesn't really help us store anything as far as a key. We can't get the key out of that hash. And it's on a page, so it's in band. That's not a good example about a band either. Uh, the next highest at 20% was encrypted with a private key and transmitted via email. We're encrypting it and sending it across the network. We consider that to be an in-band communication. And the next highest is hash of a key sent over a VPN tunnel. Although it is hashed, it's on a VPN tunnel. There's a lot of protection and encryption we assign to this particular data stream. It's still in band. It's not out of band, which means the only good answer to this one is the 36% of you that said C. It is verbally discussed and verified over a conference call speakerphone. And again, we're assuming, of course, this is a POTS line or something that's not going on the network, or else it would be an in-band connection. But this would be the best example of an out-of-band key exchange. Not the best example, really, of the way to do it. You really don't want to sit on a conference call with a speakerphone in a room and say, all right, the key is 47X, capital H. I can hear you. I hear what you're doing. Have you ever been in an airport or somewhere public and somebody's reading off a credit card number because they're purchasing something? I could be right there writing down the credit card number. Oh, what's your expiration? Thank you. And what's the CVV? Thank you. Got it. That's, that's all you need. You have to wonder what people think. So although C would not really be what you would want to do, I don't think it is, in this particular case, the best example of an out-of-band key exchange. So if you answered C, you got that one absolutely right. Well done. You 39% of you, they answered that one, did a very good job. Let's try another one, shall we? Let's keep this party going. I've got another one. This one kind of gets outside the scope of key exchanges so much. And we're talking more about the security of transferring files from one place to the other. So the question specifically is which of these would be the best choice to verify the integrity of a file transfer? This is actually a pretty important part of working with files and communicating them, especially in security, since integrity is an important part of that security triangle that we work with. So you've got a few options available. So you have to first know what would help you verify the integrity of a file transfer. And then you have to choose the best choice that might be here. And I have a number of options for you, of course. No Googling. Don't do that. The options are AES, SHA-2, RSA, 3DES. I don't want to say the name of it. And Blowfish, which is, is a name. That's the only thing here that doesn't have an acronym associated with it. Which would have, one of these would be the best choice to verify the integrity of a file transfer? If you think you know the answer, go to Socrative.com, go to the student login, and go to the professor messer room. These are questions that I think are, are pretty common to get with the CompTIA certification. You're going to be prompted to perform a particular task or to know how to perform a particular task like this one, verifying the integrity of a file transfer. And then they give you a lot of different technologies to choose from. So you have to be able to do this on the piece. One of these is going to be a pretty important piece of verifying integrity. So think about the best choice for this. In fact, there really is only one good choice here for verifying file integrity. Um, and that would be the one that you should be looking at selecting. I'll give you a couple more seconds to come up with this one. And I think there's a good opportunity here to figure out what it might be. In fact, you should really just go through this list. And if you know what these are, you should be able to pick out what it is and perhaps what it might not be. So you've got some options there to be able to work with that. There is quite a bit um, that you will run into whenever you're transferring files from one place to the other, or any type of data from one place to the other. And you're going to need to verify that the information that you've received is exactly the information that was sent originally. And that's what we're trying to do when we're verifying this information. Let's see how we did. Well, we had one standout. 70% of you said SHA-2, but 14% of you said AES. And then we have single digits for the other options here. Is this going to be one of those examples where we go through and 
look at what the options might be and everybody chooses one and it's really something else. Let's have a look at what these might be. Let's start uh, with these different options. And I think in this case, we had a pretty good idea what the answer might be. SHA is a secure hash algorithm. This is something the NSA created. They're ones that do a lot on the encryption side, and they certainly needed a way to verify information being sent back and forth. The first SHA was really SHA-1. This was very widely used. It was, in today's, today's terms, 100, only 160 bits. But in those terms back then, there was this was pretty good. The problem with SHA-1, though, is that we were able to identify collisions with the algorithm. And collisions is something you're trying to avoid when you're trying to check the integrity of a file. This meant that you would have a hash created of the original file. You could modify the file, perform the same SHA-1 function to it, and get the same hash. That's a collision. That should not happen. If anything changes with the data stream, the, then something should change with the hash. So something was flawed in the algorithm that allowed us to make some changes to the original stream and yet have an identical hash on the other side. You do not want that to happen. So we prefer now SHA-2. Allows up to digests uh, that can go as high as 512 bits. And most people these days, if they're doing something where they need a lot of security, that's a good way to do it with plenty there. We really don't use SHA-1 anymore because of the collision. You're never quite certain that the information you received when you're comparing a SHA-1 hash matches what happened originally because of those collisions. Now, collisions aren't generally something that's accidental. You really have to know exactly what you're doing to change or modify the data in a way that maintains that collision. But why, why even have the option? Let's avoid it completely, and we'll do everything with SHA-2. So if you're one of the folks that answered B, SHA-2, the 69% of you, I fooled nobody. That one is absolutely correct. You did a great job with that one. So let me see if I can give you one that's maybe changed up a little bit. We're going to see if we understand what some of these terms are that we'll be faced with on the Security Plus exam. So my question for you is, which of these would be best described as a false positive? Let's see if you know which one of these might be a false positive. You're going to run into false positives when you work in security. It's absolutely going to happen. So there's, there's no. No, uh, no ideas um, that you'll run into. That you'll have no idea uh, how much of this you'll happen to see. In fact, it's always a question if there's a false positive. So it's important to know what these are. The options I have for you are, A, is it malware infected a computer without any warning or notification? Is a false positive that my IPS issued an alert message during a distributed denial of service attack? Did a scan identify a Microsoft RPC vulnerability on a Linux file server? Did a redundant router automatically activate after a primary router failure? Or is it that a virus attempted to infect a workstation but was removed by antivirus software? Whew. OK, you're going to have to parse these out. You're going to have to read through them and figure out which one of these would be described as a false positive. Now, if you think you know the answer, go to Socrative.com. Or if you're just joining us, you can join in as well. Obviously, if you're watching this on the replay, we don't have this live. You can't, you can't really do this after the fact. You can follow along in our video, of course. But you have to be here live on these events to be able to interactively choose the right one at Socrative.com. Click the student login and go to the room name Professor Messer. And you'll be able to find everything you need. So one of these is going to be a false positive. I'm going to take a peek in here. And we've got, we got a, we, I think we got a mixed bag here of what a false positive might be on this. We have to think about it. Stop Googling what a false positive is. I can feel you. I'm looking at a couple of people here in the chat. Um, you folks are doing pretty well with this, though. You're hanging in there. You're trying it out to see if you really know what it happens to be. So let's see how we did with answering this and trying to figure out what a false positive might be. Because I've given you five different scenarios that are remarkably common. These are things you will run into all the time with security. Try to take them directly from the experiences that I've had working in the security industry. And these are things you do actually run into. So what would be a false positive? Let's see how we did. Let's click the button. Well, 57% of you, over half said, a scan identified a Microsoft RPC vulnerability on a Linux file server. But 21% of you said, malware infected a computer without any warning 
or notification. And 15% said a redundant router was automatically activated after a primary router failure. Which one of these would it be? False positives are something, as I mentioned, we run into quite a bit in security. And a false positive is when you get a report that something happened, that report isn't true at all. So something was positively identified as an issue, but it was positively identified falsely. You did not really have that happen. You had a message come through that said, the sky is falling. You go outside, the sky is fine. That's a false positive. So the sky is falling false positives are something you really have to keep up with because you will get alerts and alarms from so many different devices in your security infrastructure. You've got intrusion prevention systems, intrusion detection systems that have signatures. And it just uh, the laws of statistics will eventually, the laws of large numbers, will cause certain signatures to fire even though the signature itself wasn't actually a real attack. That's a false positive. In fact, it's one of the biggest problems people have with their intrusion prevention systems is that they'll get an alert, but it won't actually be accurate. That's, that's, uh, that's something because I come from a background of working with intrusion prevention and doing a lot of this. And you have to struggle. The very good intrusion prevention systems are those that are really only giving you accurate and complete views of what's going on. They're minimizing the number of false positives. One of the things you run into a lot was with workstation antivirus. This is one, uh, not a great false positive. It's one that was a little bit old at this point, but I left it in because it was such a dramatic example of what a false positive can do when things go wrong. This was with McAfee antivirus, the virus scan product, which is the workstation virus scan product from McAfee in April of 2010 thought a very important executable in Windows service host, svchost.exe, thought it was a virus. So what it did was delete it. It moved it off of the system to protect your system, except it really wasn't a virus. That was a false positive. So if you rebooted your Windows XP system after this had found the virus, it couldn't boot because that was a very important executable to have. If you were able to get to the system fast enough, you could replace it before it rebooted and you'd be OK. There was a, a mad dash once everyone figured this piece out. There was another one in October 2011. Security Essentials from Microsoft thought that the Chrome browser was malware, that it was a part of a botnet, and just deleted the browser. Who needed that browser? This is something that is all too common, and it happens all the time on everyone's network. And by all the time, I mean all the time, every day you're going to see a false positive because there are so many different devices. They are all looking at very different things. And it's very difficult to fine tune something down so that you're not going to get a false positive, but you still receive an actual alarm that is real. Quite a challenge. Uh, you, you should always think about verifying these alerts and alarms in some way. Either a second opinion, uh, maybe a human being has to look at it. Maybe you use a secondary piece of software. Here was one where I worked with a customer that ran multiple antivirus systems in their security department for their workstations. I know that you've probably heard, a lot of people have heard, you can't run multiple antivirus engines on the same operating system at the same time. And that's not entirely true. There are some uh, antivirus systems that work just fine with each other. And that's what this organization did in their security department, was run it. And that way, it would run through a couple of different antivirus uh, programs before ever seeing what was really happening. So they'd be able to compare and contrast some of the alerts they were getting and at least have that second opinion that they could use for a false positive. So if you're someone who did answer the 55% of you that said, see, a scan identified a Microsoft RPC vulnerability on a Linux web server, obviously the Linux web server isn't running the Microsoft operating system. Microsoft remote procedure calls are a very integral part of the Microsoft operating systems. You're not going to see those on a Linux device, certainly not one running a Linux web server. So that would be a false positive. You got that one absolutely correct. For those of you that did answer the 21 that said malware infected a computer without any warning or notification, that's the reverse of a false positive. That's a false negative. I should have gotten a warning, and it got infected. I got zero warning. False negative occurred. That's almost as bad, in some cases worse, because something bad really did happen, and you have no idea. 
that that. So Rob Sandberg's a little bit of, ahead of me in the chat room. My my audio is delayed by about 10 seconds. Never mind. You guys got it. That's what it, you're absolutely right. He's, he's reading my mind. He's right there. There's so many different things you have to know on the exam about false positives, false negatives, all of the different encryption algorithms, the hashing algorithms, the things we've already talked about. Well, I've taken all of this from every single one of my videos, and I've collapsed it down into one set of course notes. This is a 35-page PDF that goes and steps through all of the important things from my Security Plus videos. So anything that you're seeing in my video, I've put in here. So network design, cloud computing, protocols, encryption, security, risk management, security. All of these bullets from all of those different videos. You could, of course, draw the pictures yourself. You could write things down yourself and do it. Or you can help support my site by purchasing my course notes for $10. Go to professormesser.com slash security CN, and you'd have the course notes. Here they are. Here's the they're just a PDF file. You'll get it immediately. It is not protected, so you can put it on all of your devices. This is something, everything that you use personally, you're uh, licensed to put it on all of those different devices. So put it on your mobile phone, put it on your tablet, put it on your computer, so that wherever you happen to be, you'll be able to pull this up and have a look at all of the different things you need to know for the Security Plus exam. If you want to know more about that, you'd like to read more about what can happen with that, it, you, you can go to professormesser.com slash security CN. This is uh, also every dollar of this goes back to keeping the website running. I charge nothing for my videos. This is a great way if people have often said, I'd like to contribute to what you're doing. Well, I don't accept donations. I want to give you something in return for what you're doing. So this is something I think I've got a good price point on. And at 35 pages, it makes a great guide to go through just before you walk in to get your exam. It doesn't replace a book. It doesn't replace the videos. Something to help supplement what you're doing with your exam plans as well. You can find that professormesser.com slash security CN. Let's go also now and look at more questions. Let's go back to this. This is one where it's a little, little close to the things I like to do, protocol analyzers. I spent quite a bit of time working for a company that did nothing but protocol analysis. So this is uh, something that I hold very close to my heart. Which of these would be the best use of a protocol analyzer? Let's see how we did. We've got some options, rather, to go through. Would this be to provide real-time protection against known malware? Would it be to forward known good traffic across subnets? Would it provide content filtering for URLs? Would it allow me to reverse engineer a virus executable? Or would it allow me to identify the source of a DOS attack? So which of those would be the best use of a protocol analyzer? Now, of course, a protocol analyzer has a huge amount of things you can do with it. It is the Swiss army knife of networking. You ever want to find out where a problem is really occurring and what an application is really doing? And if your data is really encrypted, this is a good way to do that. So there are other things you can do. And one of those other things is in this list that's available to you. If you think you know what the answer is, go to professormesser.com. Oh, go to Socrative.com. There's no links from my site. I should put one on my live page that would get you there. The student login, somebody make a note. Uh, the student login and go to room name Professor Messer. I wonder if there's a way to just take you right there. I should make a link that just dumps you right into that particular page. There probably is. I need to work on that. In the meantime, you can, you can type those things out, and I will see how you do with the answer here. See if you can figure out what the best use of a protocol analyzer is. I did. I used to work for, at the time, it was Network General. It was acquired or merged with McAfee and became Network Associates. For a while, I worked for McAfee in that regard. Uh, and then there was a divestment, and Network General went back to being Network General, and McAfee went back or they went back to being McAfee. We split up. There was a divorce. And then Network General was bought by uh, NetScout. And currently, the Sniffer Technologies that's there are owned by the NetScout Corporation. So that is where uh, I really got into protocol analysis. Obviously, being a systems engineer there, you needed to understand a lot about the way that these technologies work. So it was one of those that really did allow you to understand how to make the most of a protocol analyzer. And let's see how we think we should make the most of a protocol analyzer. Almost half of us say that it is good for identifying the source of a DOS attack. But 22% said we can use this to forward known good traffic across subnets. And another 22% said I can use this to provide content filtering for URLs. 
This is one of those cases, by the way, where you could almost do all of this with a protocol analyzer. But this is one of those questions that's very common to get on the exam where there might technically be more than one answer here that might apply. But if you read the question carefully, it asks, which would be the best use of a protocol analyzer? So you need to have some concept of a protocol analyzer. And you need to have a way to put this in context. Each one of these answers needs to be added to the context. So let's look at protocol analyzers and what they can provide. I've got a screenshot here of the Wireshark absolutely free protocol analyzer that you can download right now from Wireshark.org. The, the name is often called a sniffer. But a sniffer, as I mentioned, is an actual product that is trademarked at this point by NetScout Systems. But we often call it a sniffer because at the time, the, the sniffer product from Network General was the one that everyone knew about. It's almost like a Kleenex or a Xerox. We are using it such a generic name. But in reality, that's an actual product. Wireshark is the one that's absolutely free. You go out. It, it captures packets. It shows you where the traffic's coming from, where traffic is going to. Helps you understand what's inside these data packets as they're going across the network. Wireshark is the real popular open source option for this. Absolutely free. You can load it on all of your systems. It runs in Linux. It runs in Windows. It runs in Mac OS X uh, and other things as well. And you can find that at Wireshark.org. And it is a great way to learn networking. You can really see what's going on. And if you ever in a situation where somebody says the network is slow, or this application isn't working right, or they're going to say the network isn't working right, you can pop open your Wireshark, capture some packets, and show them, know it's your application that is performing badly because it is 99% of the time. But unless you have a way to see into the packets, you'll have no way to know. And seeing into the packets is the important part. Would this provide us real-time protection against known malware? Packet analyzers, they capture information and display information, but they don't stop or restrict the, the flow of data across the network. It would not forward any known good traffic across subnets. It's not a router. That's what a router does. It does not provide content filtering for URLs. Content filtering means we're going to actively filter out data. And as I mentioned, a protocol analyzer doesn't filter anything. Simply looks at the information going by. Reverse engineering a virus executable be very difficult to do that with a protocol analyzer. You need some way to decompile and step through the machine code if you want to be able to do that. The answer, and 46% of you knew this answer, was that identify the source of a denial of service attack. A denial of service attack is one that is generally coming from one single source. So there's probably a source IP address, and a protocol analyzer is exceptional at showing you exactly where traffic is coming from and where traffic is going to. If you want to find that DOS, you'd be able to find the IP address, set a filter on your firewall, and now all is good. So of course, as I mentioned, many other things you can do with a protocol analyzer. But if you answered E in this particular question, identify the source of a DOS attack, you would have gotten this one absolutely correct. Well, let's shift gears from the tools that you would use on the network. And let's talk a little bit about how we look at the data that's on our network. In fact, the question here is, which of these would best describe the analysis of data at rest? It's a very specific term. You can see it's even in quotations, data at rest. So we're referring to something very specific with this question. In fact, the, the term data at rest should immediately invoke something in your mind. Your options available, and I've got quite a few on this one, A through F, is AES, DLP, IPsec, RAID, IPS, and RADIUS. A bunch of letters. I threw a bunch of letters at the screen. That's how they ended up. So it's got to be one of these, though. One of these would best describe the analysis of data at rest. If you think you know the answer, go to Socrative.com. Click on the student login. Go to the Professor Messer room. No answering in the chat room. No Googling. That one's too easy to Google. So don't Google that one. You don't want to do that. Who would want to Google these? You should be able to take a guess at it. Take a stab. This is what would happen on the exam, after all. Have a look at what the question and the answers are. See if you can figure it out. Some of these technologies you may know. And you may think, well, I know what that technology is, and I've never heard the term data at rest associated with that particular technology. 
So you may be able to step through some of these and remove them just as a matter of your existing knowledge, even if you don't know what this happens to be. This is a pretty important technology that we use in security. So it's one and it's a term and a set of terms that you're going to hear about if you're working at all in the security world. In fact, you'll hear about this if you're not working in the security world, I think. It's that that popular and that important of a particular set of terms. If you think you know the answer, go to Socrative.com and you'll be able to see what the answer might be. In this, in this case, I think we've I think we've been able, I think I threw one at you that maybe mixed us up a bit. In fact, we've, we're sort of all over the place. I guess we have two that are very close to each other. 37% just ahead of everybody is DLP. 35% is RAID. And it all drops off from there. Radius is 14%. And then single digits for IPS and IPsec. Nobody choose, chose AES. Wouldn't it be great if it was AES? Wouldn't that be a killer? Oh, nope, somebody got 2%. So wouldn't be wouldn't be so great to have that there. That'd be something. Well, whenever we run into these particular terms, what we're really talking about is something called data loss prevention. So if you are working with any important data, and, and I really, in, in many ways, all data is important at some level. But we're talking about, and when we're talking about data loss prevention, we're often talking about things that are personally identifiable information or very private information, medical records, social security numbers, um, information like credit card details, things that you don't want other people to get their hands on. So this isn't just normal data that might be in a file. This is something that's very specific. But of course, data loss prevention can apply to any type of data. And you can protect anything that might be on your network with data loss prevention. We want to stop the bad guys, of course, before they get to this. Whenever this data leaks out, is when we have our largest problems. And one of the challenges you have is that when people are getting into the network and they're getting at the data, things like a data breach, very often if this is from the outside, they're in your network for a very long period of time. It's only usually in, in the average is a couple of months they are in your network before you even realize they're there. And you can close the door. Well, at that point, data has already leaked out. So you want to be able to monitor how data is going through the network, where it happens to be, and if anybody is accessing that information. So there's so many places you can look. You can, of course, look at the ingress, egress point of your network. Usually, there might be a firewall there. You might have a router connecting to an internet connection. There might be a VPN connection being used for your partners or for your internal users. There may be other parts of your network that are not in the data center that are outside the data center. That would be a good place to check because that, that private information may be self-contained in the data center and should never get out of the data center. So one of the challenges with DLP is you need to be able to find this data wherever it happens to sit. And the data, of course, has many different ways of going back and forth across the network. It might be on your computer. You might have an application up. You might be looking at medical records. If you work in a hospital, it's a very normal thing to do. This is data in use. So generally, there will be a data loss prevention that will be running on the same device to make sure that you're not looking at something you should not be looking at. If your particular workstation did not have access to medical records and medical records pop up on the screen, this DLP looking at data in use on your computer would be able to identify that. We also have net data that's going across your network. There's no other way to get it from point A to point B unless it does go across your network. You will hear that referred to as data in motion. And so DLP solutions for data in motion might sit on the network itself, that all traffic on the network has to go in and out of this device. And it's going to examine every bit and every byte going across the network to determine if somebody's transferring something that they should not be. It's going to look for credit card numbers and social security numbers and anything else that's important to check and protect on your network. If the data is on your server, then it's just sitting in a file. Nobody's using it, but it is being stored. We call that data at rest. And we want to be sure that if there's data being stored on a server, that's data that is supposed to be there. Bad guys are usually taking this private information and storing it somewhere locally before they send it off. So if somehow that data gets out of the database in the data center and suddenly ends up on a server that is in the accounting department, 
that may be a big problem. Medical records shouldn't be in the accounting department, so there's probably software on those servers looking at data at rest to make sure that nothing too important is there. So if we go back to our question about which of these would best describe the analysis of data at rest, we are specifically talking about DLP this data loss prevention. So if you answered B, DLP, it would be absolutely correct. Rate is the one that tied for the answer here, got exactly the same percentage of 37%. This is the redundant array of independent or inexpensive disks. This is something used to provide either an increase in performance or redundancy of our storage subsystems. And although the data at rest may be stored on a RAID array. Whenever we're talking about the analysis of that data at rest, we are very specifically talking about data loss prevention. So if you answered B, you got that one absolutely correct. I think we're on a roll. I think we're doing pretty well. And I think we learned something with that one. So remember that if you ever run into DLP, data loss prevention, data at rest, data in motion, data in use, that's exactly what we're talking about. Well, since we're talking about security and malware and other things specific to it, let's do a question about it. This question is, what kind of malware can be invisible to the operating system? There's a specific kind of malware that does a very good job of hiding itself. And would that be polymorphic malware, a botnet, spyware, a rootkit, a trojan, or a worm? It's got to be one of these, right? What kind of malware can be invisible to an operating system? And this is, again, one of those cases where you really do want to be sure you're picking the best possible answer. And although this question doesn't say which one of these would be the best answer, that is one of the overriding, uh, overriding instructions you're given for the exam, is that on every single one of these, answer which one would be the best answer. And one of these is going to be really the best answer. It really jumps out. If you think you know what the answer is, you can go to Socrative.com as well and see if you know what these happen to be. So in the, in the chat room, talking about data loss prevention, yeah, it's important that you're telling people to close any uh, patient information or to hide anything that might be PII, the personally identifiable information that might be running on someone's machine. You run into this when you're in environments where people are dealing with sensitive data. And they deal with it all the time. But you're walking into an environment where you don't want to see someone's medical records. You don't want to see someone's financial data. You're not interested in seeing anything about those. So it becomes a little bit of a challenge when you're working. So you tell people, I'm about to connect to your machine or let me sit down. Have you closed out everything, gotten rid of everything on the screen? In government environments where it is very high security, uh, they will literally turn their screens off, close the tops of their laptops when somebody walks through the room who does not have the proper clearance. That way they can be assured that nobody ever was able to see anything over your shoulder because they turned all of those off. In this case, we're talking about malware, though. So let's see how we did with this one. What kind of malware would be invisible to an operating system? I just can't see it at all. What would it be? Let's see how we did. 76% of you, a vast majority, said D rootkit. But 15% of you, the next highest, said that could be a Trojan. This is invisible to the operating system. So which one of these would it be? Would it be a rootkit or a Trojan? Did we mess this one up? Did we, did we fool ourselves with this? I don't think we did. Rootkit is indeed the type of malware that is hidden, if you will, from the operating system. Sometimes it is completely hidden. Sometimes it is obfuscated from the operating system. And we'll talk about the differences there. The name comes from Linux, where when you are root, you have complete access to the system. And so rootkit is something that was originally a bit of a, a Unix-ish Unix technique. We've used the name to apply to this type of malware, however. It's almost always a rootkit is going to find its way and modify some very key files of the operating system. The only way you can hide from the operating system is if you are putting blinders on the operating system and it can't see you. And one way you do that is to make sure that you're changing the operating system so that it's just blacked out from wherever you happen to be. This is something you're probably not going to be even able to see in something like Task Manager and Windows. It becomes part of the underlying operation of the OS, and it is built to hide itself. It doesn't want to show up as a normal executable. This is also something, since we can't see it 
as part of the normal operating system, it becomes very hard to see this with traditional antivirus or anti-malware software because it's looking through what's coming through the OS. And if the OS can't see this particular piece of malware, then it can't see it to scan it. So it's a bit of a catch-22 with that particular piece. We also have times where it's not really hidden to the operating system, but if we were to look through the operating system, it looks like a normal file. It is, it is in some way hidden. You might not want to call this a, a true, pure rootkit, but it certainly applies at being able to do this um, and work with these pieces. There are ways, though, you can find rootkits and identify what's on your system and see if you can remove those. One good way to do it is to do something like use Rootkit Revealer, which is designed to look at not the operating system executables, but what's starting up the operating system. And if we can see that anything might have been changed in the operating system, the remover may be able to identify that and then remove that particular rootkit from the system. This is one where if you're working with rootkits, you're going to run into these all the time and being able to understand what's happening with them. And whenever there is a rootkit, it's a big deal. It's not like we have these happen all the time. Um, this is one where it's a relatively common occurrence. We'll get one or two a year that are really important to find. When somebody finds a vulnerability that allows a rootkit to get onto your system, everybody's on board. You do not want this rootkit going anywhere on your system. So, And this is one usually where, because it's so hard to identify, you may not even know it's there. So usually when someone announces, we found a new rootkit, you are usually going and finding out where that is, testing all of your systems, and trying to identify where a rootkit might be on, on your network. Um, it can be quite a challenge in working through them. So you, of course, want to be able to identify those as well. Let's have a look at how we did with this one. I think we had quite a few people answer this. So if you were one of the people that did answer D rootkit, the 76% of you would have gotten that one absolutely correct. I didn't fool anyone with that one, did I? It would not be Trojan. A Trojan Trojan horse is a, uh, a piece of malware that doesn't fool your operating system. It's not invisible to the OS. It's invisible to you. It tricked you. It said, hey, click here for a fun game. And you click, and it may even show you a fun game, but behind the scenes, it's installing malware. And the operating system in that case can see this particular piece of malware. A Trojan's not hidden from the operating system. It's just hidden from you. And that's a completely different set of problems, isn't it? Well, let's uh, now shift gears a bit. I want to explain to you uh, how important it is these, these performance-based questions and being able to work with them on your exam. Whenever I start working with uh, and going through the exam objectives, and that's what I do whenever I'm going through and working and creating my videos, I'm, I'm trying to understand what is going to be asked of you. I'm going through the task of figuring out how am I going to explain this particular topic. Sometimes it requires that I go to a command line or that I present a diagram or explain how we're able to accomplish this in the quote unquote real world. This is one of the challenges when you're working on an exam like this because you're often studying from a book. You're often studying from course notes or you're studying from other things that are written down. It's very often sometimes to be able to really work with these technologies. And that's why uh, I like these technologies that GTS Learning has. They're freestyle live labs. So you can log on online. Here's uh, real time, the live labs that are running here. And I've started up an exercise that is the Security Plus Protocols and Services, the DNS module. And it steps you through the entire module, uh, gives you screenshots of exactly what you need to have. In fact, here we're running Wireshark to be able to perform this. And I've just logged in, and I've told the, the system I want to be able to connect to these devices. It's brought up a number of virtual devices, a server, a client, a gateway, a router, and a Linux device running LAMP. It's got a lot of different uh, pieces in this particular lab. But it, you can click on one of these, like the server, and it brings up effectively a remote desktop using, in this case, HTML5 that's built into my Chrome browser here. And so I've got a live configuration that I can work with. You can see the response time is fantastic on this because I'm really just getting screenshots. All the work is being done from the server that's located somewhere else. So here's my Wireshark. 
I've got interfaces. We can start capturing data. And so just by clicking around, I'm now performing the tasks that are in this particular lab. And I've not just got a server. I've also got a client running that I can connect to. This looks like it's a, a Windows uh, machine, a Windows XP device. There are gateways and routers and other devices. So this is like a real world. You've even got XP machines that are still out there in the world operating. And now we can see how would this affect the network from a security perspective. And of course, you can click back and forth. Your server's still there to see how this is running. Now, maybe you've already got your own system set up. You've got your own technologies running in your lab. You're running everything in your own virtual machines. Maybe that works for you, and that's great. But if you don't have these mini operating systems, you don't have the labs already set up, or you'd just like to see if this is for you, you can use this for an hour for absolutely free. Just go to professormesser.com slash seclabs. You can try it out and see if it's for you. And I've got special pricing from the folks at GTS Learning for these Security Plus labs. And you can see for yourself if this is something that you would like to try. Uh, the way to get the special pricing, though, is to go through this link. If you go to the GTS Learning site directly, you don't get the special pricing. So you pay more. I want you to pay less at professormesser.com slash seclabs, and you'll be able to step through this and play around with Wireshark and use these technologies and do this yourself. Uh, the price that I think GTS Learning usually has is about $159. You get it for $99. So use that special URL, professormesser.com slash seclabs, and try it for free for an hour. See if it's for you. If it's not, it's not. But maybe this is something that can get you through those performance-based questions for your exam. Well, let's get to other questions. That might be another way to help out on your exam is see if you can get some of these right. And the question I have for you is dealing with something called a TPM. So which of these would you be most likely to use a TPM? It's got to be one of these things, right? So go to Socrative.com, and you'll be able to see what some of these responses might be. Would it be to enable full disk encryption? Would it be to preserve evidence of a security incident? Would it be to verify a digital signature? Would it allow me to shield against electromagnetic interference? Would it be protecting data on a wireless network? Or would it be storing sensitive data in the cloud? So one of these would be the most likely use of a TPM. It's got to be one of those. Don't answer in the chat room. And you can, of course, go through and answer this on Socrative.com. Go to the student login, and you'll be able to go to the Professor Messer room and see if you know the answer of what this might be. I'm going to take a peek while we're doing this in here. I think folks are very familiar with TPMs based on these numbers. We might actually have, we have a few that are popping up here and there to figure out these pieces, which would be, and again, it's that great term that you'll see on the exam, most likely to use a TPM because there could be about two or even three examples here that could possibly apply, but only one is really the most likely. Oh, and Aaron in the chat room, I'm sorry, your TPM died. And so you know why what what this applies to. Well, if your TPM has a problem, I would imagine that'd be very unusual for a TPM to to stop operating. It's obviously something that that is an important thing. Um, well, you don't hear about that though. I guess it's certainly possible. Everything on your computer or your network or your servers or your router can possibly fail at some point. So you never know what it could be. So uh, which one of these would most likely be the use of a TPM? Well, we should figure it out. Folks are Googling frantically to figure I can tell by the numbers. I can tell how many people have answered so far and base it on how quick you are. So let's see how we did. Well, 61% of you said it allows you to enable full disk encryption. But 19% said the most likely use of a TPM would be to verify a digital signature. And 11% said the most likely use would be to protect data on a wireless network. So which one of these would it be? In fact, the three things here that I think a TPM would most apply towards would be the three things we chose. So you guys did a great job at breaking down what we thought it might be. Uh, but let's see what a TPM actually is. It stands for Trusted Platform Module. And this is, uh, it's really a specification. But we talk about the technology that we use to implement the specification as the name of it itself. So we often will say, this, this on your motherboard is a TPM. Well, it's actually a TPM chip. 
it's a chip that allows us to use the TPM specification. But that's that's more of a semantic issue than anything. It's it's just a processor. There's a little picture of a TPM I have on the screen right there. That's uh, sometimes the TPM is integrated into the motherboard itself. Sometimes it's an optional module that can be plugged in and unplugged, like the one that's in this picture. And, and as Aaron said in the chat room, yep, your hardware fails. Because it's, it's a piece of hardware. As you can see here, there's no moving parts. But like anything else with electronics, it only works for so long, doesn't it? This is something that is what we call persistent memory. There are keys that are burned into the TPM. So what a great place to go to get very unique keys that can then be used to perform some very important encryption. And on a single device, some very important encryption might be to enable full disk encryption. That's a great reason to have these keys available. And they're keys that are specific to this piece of hardware. They're keys that you can't get anywhere else. They're only going to be on the system. So a very specific kind of hardware that we have there. It's also password protected. It doesn't allow for dictionary attacks. This isn't something you can easily get to. It is designed as a piece of hardware that is going to be very, very difficult to find and get into to find out what that key might be. So if you're one of the folks that answered enabling full disk encryption, that would be, in fact, one of the most common uses of a trusted platform module on a computer. In fact, if you try to install something like BitLocker on Windows, and you don't have a TPM on your motherboard, it will tell you, I have nowhere to even store this key information. I have nowhere to, come to, to really get the, the, the key piece of this, the encryption cryptography piece of this running. So you're going to need to provide me with a USB key. And we'll plug in the USB key, and we'll store the keys there. Uh, in fact, that becomes it's a little bit challenging, of course, if you lose that USB key or somebody else gains access to the USB key, that could be an issue. So most people don't even allow you to use that method of full disk, disk encryption. You have to have a TPM on your motherboard to use BitLocker or any other kind of full disk encryption. And yes, there's TPMs on, on every type of, of operating a hardware you would find. A TPM is not in an operating system. It's not in Windows. It's not in OS X. It's not in Linux. It's in the hardware that's running that operating system. So that's an important uh, consideration when you start working with it. And when you're dealing with things like full disk encryption, TPM is a great thing to use to be able to do that. Um, that's one of the things that you will be asked on the Security Plus exam is very specific to full disk encryption, and the things that you might need. Or you may be just asked a one-off question about a TPM. we got a few minutes left, so let's get one more question in, shall we? Let's deal with firewalls, something that's near and dear to my heart. I just spent almost seven years working for a next generation firewall company as a systems engineer. So I like firewall questions. So I wanted to be able to get one to you before we were done today. Which of these would you enable in your firewall to allow normal DNS queries? So that's one of those things that you would use to be able to work with your firewall. So you have to know things like port numbers. So I gave you a bunch of port numbers. These port numbers look very similar to each other, however. Is this TCP 25, UDP 23, UDP 53, UDP 25, TCP 55, or UDP 35? It's got to be one of these, right? So which of these would you turn on, enable in your firewall to allow normal DNS queries? Do not Google that one. That one's too easy to Google. So just take a guess. Figure out what piece of it it might be. In fact, I made this one even easier than I probably should have. I should have made it even harder. Next time, I will with those pieces. Uh, and File Vault is the, is the disk encryption in OS X. There's, uh, I guess you can use other types of full disk encryption in OS X. Um, there are some other third-party disk encryption solutions out there to be able to use. And they do take advantage of a TPM when they're working with them. But other companies will provide. There are other companies that make full disk encryption software, commercial software for OS X and other ones as well. Port numbers, back to this question, port numbers are an important part of the Security Plus exam. There's a large list you have to know. And it's because of this. We want to be able to configure firewalls. It's an important security consideration, even if we're just doing it by port number. Now, these days, of course, firewalls can identify things like applications. There's IPS functionality built in. It can do content filtering. Uh, it can do DLP. There's so many different functions built into today's firewalls. So we're asking a very basic question about normal DNS queries. So we look at this. 
We're sort of torn, aren't we? Not really. 73% of you said, well, that's UDP. Port 53 is what that happens to be. And you'd be absolutely right with that one and being able to work through the port numbers. The other port numbers I put in here, some of them are very common numbers that you do need to know for your exam. Uh, but other port numbers that here are ones that are very uncommon, and you do not need to know them for the exam. I just put down random numbers. Now, of course, there's some application somewhere that uses that. But if you're trying to figure out what you need to know for your exam, go to the CompTIA exam objectives. And they'll be able to tell you what it happens to be. The only UDP port number, well, we're not going to do, only UDP port number that you need to know, in fact, is UDP port 53, which is DNS queries. This is the UDP that is used to do the normal name lookup. So when you type in www.google.com, it has to first perform this DNS lookup to be able to find out what the IP address of www.google.com happens to be. And it is UDP over port 53 that's able to do that. And in fact, in the, mat room, uh, the chat room, Matt is talking and saying, uh, if you're doing zone queries, which is a transfer of data between DNS servers or a large transfer of DNS data between a DNS server and a client, it uses TCP to accomplish that TCP port 53. Zone transfers are very often not enabled from a firewall perspective because zone transfers are not something that's commonly done. And usually somebody's trying to pull down a lot of DNS information and do some recon. Uh, unless there's a very specific reason to do a zone transfer. And in that case, you want to set up a very specific set of rules in your firewall to allow that between those particular devices. So if you're one of the folks that answered C, UDP port 53, you got that one absolutely correct. I mentioned earlier how important it is to have a list of the exam objectives. Folks will come into the chat room all the time during the month. And they'll say, I'm about to sit for my exam. I've got my exam next week, or it's in a few days. What should I do to prepare? What's the last minute things I can do? And my recommendation always is to go to the CompTIA website, download the latest exam objectives, and use it as a final checklist. Go through every single one of the CompTIA exam objectives. And it's an enormous list. It's a huge list. They tell you everything you need to know to be able to do that. So you want to be sure that you are, are checking off as many things as possible. And if you're not able to check something off, you know exactly what you need to go study. So make sure you think about doing that. That's my best tip I can give you when you're ready to go sit in the exam. It should be the first thing you download, which is the exam objectives. Some people have never seen them before, and they're about to go take their exam. So at the very least, make sure you have it before you walk into the door of your exam. Uh, my next study group, we've come to the end of an hour. Can you believe that on this study group? I'm going to take calls for the next hour, or at least do just a standard Q&A chat while we're here since we have the time. So you're welcome to stick around after we're done. But the formal study group, alas, has come to an end. And that means that, by the way, DNS is our special keyword. If you want to be able to get your, your continuing education unit, you would go to the top of my website where it says Contact Us. You'd say that you attended the August 2015 Security Plus Study Group, and the secret word is DNS. And I'll be able to send you a certificate back that says you must have watched this. You can, of course, watch the next one, too. We've got another study group in September. It's September the 23rd. You're welcome to show up then. And we'll do a similar thing. We'll see how you do with the questions and the answers and being able to work with this. This is a great piece of that. But I've got a lot of things you can do in the meantime. You don't have to wait around until September. My Security Plus course notes you can find at professormesser.com slash security cn. If you want to find me on the World Wide Web, on the social media, as the kids say, you type professormesser.com and you'll end up anywhere. Slash YouTube, slash Twitter, slash Google Plus, slash Facebook. And usually I look at those in about that order. I probably spend a little more time on Twitter than anything, although I'm usually not sending a lot of information. I try to get a few things out there here and there to be able to work with it. Remember your discounted vouchers. You can save 10% off of any of your CompTIA vouchers. You can find that at professormesser.com slash vouchers. And don't forget the free hour that you can get for studying your live labs at professormesser.com slash sec labs. I would not be able to do this study group without 
all of your help. So I want to thank you as well. Thank you for your support. Thanks for purchasing the course notes. Thank, uh, thanks for sending me emails and sending me the tweets. I like to respond and say hey to everyone and see how you did with your Security Plus studies. We're going to do another one of these next month as well. Thanks for attending, everybody. Remember to stick around for the after show, and we'll see you next time on the study group. Well, that was a lot. So your YouTube died. This happened again also on the study group that uh, YouTube had a bit of a problem with the stream right in the middle of everything. And everybody uh, died out of this one. In this case, everybody stayed in there. I didn't have any massive problems with that. So that worked out fine. Let's get our, uh, I want to turn on the phone lines just so we can have it there, just so we can have that piece there. You're welcome to call in, but you don't have to. Uh, I like to have it there, though. I'm going to type a few things. So talk amongst yourself. I think the questions were a little bit harder on this one. Turn the Skype down just a tad while I call in. Call in the thing with the stuff. Thank you for calling, calling Studio You're welcome. And Paul yeah. Please enter your show number well, I have to figure out what my show number is, and I will do that. Um, and the pound sign. Pin and then I have to type in a pin number. Everybody got that? You have not started a show session. Well, let me do that right now. Oh, don't don't hang up on me, nice lady. Okay. Okay. Am I there? Yes, I'm there. Good. So if you wanted to call in, it's so complicated. How does this work? How do any of the, how does any of this work really? You can call in. Uh, you can call toll-free on Skype, uh, or call toll-free from anywhere uh, in the U.S., 855-785-RJ45. Uh, number again, 855-785-7545. You're welcome to call, or you can just write in the chat room if you have a question. And I have plenty of questions that you have sent to me. So I'm going to pull up those questions and have a look on my side as well. Got a nice group in there today. Um, there are some new courses in the works uh, for the chat room. Uh, Trevor's asking in the chat room, and I can't tell you about them. But there are new courses that are in the works. There's a lot of things that are in the works over just the next month or two. Um, there, It doesn't seem like it because there's not a lot of new things happening on my YouTube channel. There's an amazing amount of things happening behind the scenes. It's usually something that's very cyclical. You'll see a ton of things suddenly hit the YouTube and then it's quiet for a little bit. And then a ton of things hit the YouTube again. Uh, and that's normal. That's just uh, that's just how it works um, in being able to work with this. So whenever I'm working with it, um, I, there's, even though you don't see it, I'm doing a lot of things behind the scenes to be able to work with this as well. So that's where that's coming from with those pieces in that. Um, I promise you things are going on. There's, a, there's actually quite a bit happening here. Um, I've got... Um, some work that's happening next month. I plan to have um, somebody is, uh, is, I'm hiring someone. So we'll have somebody on board to help with some of the the things that you see, the marketing pieces and the pieces that get you to my website and be able to help me along those lines. So I'm looking forward to having that happen as well. I already got somebody who has accepted the position who is starting. So we'll see how that goes with those pieces. So that's pretty exciting. Um, We've got quite a bit happening with content. Um, and although I can't give you the details of it, there's so many people have asked about content and certain types of content um, on my site. So I want to be able to provide a lot more of it. So yes, I sorry, BSOD, I can't, can't tell you. I'm very sorry. You're welcome to boo that. I think that's legitimate. Um, that's a legitimate boo. You're more than welcome to, to boo that piece of it. Let me uh, bring up some of the questions you have sent me over the month. I have to bring them up and then make them nice and big on my screen to be able to, to see what's going on. Uh, you've got a lot of questions you send me whenever you register for the study group. Um, I give you a list of things. Um, so I've got this list. I, I ask you to tell me your favorite question. So this is one of the things that, that's going to be there as well. One thing I will mention, I've gotten a few questions about this uh, this past month. Uh, some questions, some people have asked me questions um, and said, um, you know, I was reading your book and I saw this. Um, and I, I hate to tell them, but I didn't write a book. 
So I hate, I hate doing that, but I, I didn't. I don't have a book. I don't have plan to write a book. It's not my, I'm not interested in writing a book. You may have seen on my website that GTS Learning has a book they've integrated my videos into, but they wrote the book. In fact, I used their book to create my videos. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing going on there. I used their book to make my videos, and then once I made my videos, they put them in their book. It's a, it's a, it's a juggling act, but we did it. Uh, and I think it's kind of nice because you can read through the book, and as you're reading a chapter in the book, you can watch the video on that chapter of the book. Uh, even if you have the printed version of the book, there's a QR code. So you could be reading the book, a physical book. It's made of dead trees. A physical book, you could be reading it, and then you can scan the QR code, and it pops up the video on that piece. That's a GTS learning book. So, so yeah, I, don't, I, I did not write that book. Uh, the folks at GTS Learning who wrote the book did a fabulous job. They're very good at writing that book. It's one of those books that it tells you exactly what you need to know for the exam, and it doesn't go outside the scope of that. I love those kind of books. Um, sometimes I like a book that goes into a lot of detail, but not when I'm planning a certification. I don't want a, a lot of that to, um, to get in the way of my studies. If I want to learn a lot about a particular topic, I'll get a book that dives into the details. But I'm not one of those people that likes to, uh, to read everything I would ever need to know on a topic if I'm only going to be tested on a very high level piece of that particular topic, if that makes sense. So that's that's where that particular question, it, it was one that came up. As I'm looking at this, um, I'm I'm right here. I mean, I'm I'm I see these questions all the time. And right at the top of the list was the one about about the book. So that was why I wanted to to talk about that piece of it. Um, there was other people, other questions that came in I added to the questions we had today. So I try to take the things that you wanted to do. A lot of you said, I need help with my port numbers. So I want to be sure to get a port number question in. So one of the questions you had come in there. In fact, it was uh, Kevin had said, anything to do with port numbers. Just give me something to do with port numbers. So that one was for you, Kevin, and being able to work with that. This one's more of a test question, which was, is there any disadvantage to completing Security Plus before I do Network Plus? And there's not. It really depends on what you're doing with your career or the reason that you're taking these certifications to begin with. Uh, the ultimate value of a certification is going to be based on what you do with it. So if Security Plus is going to give you the most value for what you're doing, take that one first. In fact, when I took my three CompTIA exams, I took the Security Plus first because I was in a role with a security company and they wanted us to get some security certifications. That wasn't the only one I got, but it was important that I get that certification. Later on, I went back and I got my Network Plus and then ultimately I got my A Plus. Uh, that is one where whenever you start looking at what makes sense to take first, you need to think about what you're doing. Are you in a role where you need to have more security knowledge? Great, take Security Plus. If you're in a role where you're doing security, you're probably not doing a lot of, of computer break fix, so you wouldn't take A+. You would, of course, take, take Security Plus first. Now, if you are in a role where you are trying to get a job with a help desk and you're trying to, uh, to learn more about supporting end users and working with operating systems and working with hardware and understanding more about Windows, then Security Plus probably isn't what you should be taking. It's very common in the network security world for people who are doing that to have a very strong foundation in networking. So although it's a security role, there's a huge amount of networking involved. Think about integrating IPS systems. Um, that's redundant, isn't it? We're integrating firewalls, integrating uh, IPsec tunnels, VPN technologies, authentication systems and databases, uh, doing, uh, doing natting. Uh, padding, understanding these port numbers, how to configure them. It's all networking. It's really just applying security principles into the networking piece. You can't integrate this unless you know how the network operates. So if you're right out of school, you're looking to get a job in IT, you probably wouldn't start with Security Plus. You'd probably start with one of the others. Again, it just depends on what's important for you and what you're trying to accomplish. I think ultimately that's, that's the important part. You want to really consider where that's coming from and how, how it's going to affect you once you get that certification. A lot of people will get a huge list of certifications. They'll get their A+, Network+, Security+, Microsoft certification, Cisco certifications, a VMware, and then they'll go try to get their first job. And they're really 
padding their resume with a lot of details that doesn't have a lot behind it. So you have to you have to right size things on your CV so that you're getting the right number of things on there. There's no reason to tout security when you don't have a job in IT yet. That's one of those things that that you will absolutely run into. One of the questions, in fact, the next question here is what's the what is the what are the performance based questions like? That is a very good question. So let's find on YouTube the performance based question from CompTIA. There they did a great video that describes the process of performance based questions. Let's see if I can find it on there. Somebody will probably link it in the chat room before I'm even able to do it. Um, they, there's a couple that are available out there. One is a short three-minute video that Pearson did on performance-based questions. But they just finished one uh, a very good overview question. Now I'm going to have to go to my Instapaper to find that because I can never find anything when I need it. You'd think that one would be uh, right there at the top of my list. I can tell BSOD is already in there trying to figure out what it is before I can can find that piece. So much easier to do when you're not in front of the microphone, isn't it? While we're doing that piece. This video goes through what all these performance-based questions might be. Because when people think about performance-based questions, they're often thinking about it's a simulation. In fact, often they use the term, I'm worried about the simulations. But it may, might not be a simulation of anything. It may very simply be found it. Taking a CompTIA exam is what it is called. Um, it may not be a simulation of anything. It may instead be uh, a set of different things you can run into. So let me see if I can show you this. Here it is. There's the YouTube taking a CompTIA exam. They play these nice music that makes you want to like stab yourself. Exam? I am. This video will show you the different Great. Exams so you, I'll flip through. It tells you what the screen's going to look like. And I think this is good. If you've never taken a CompTIA exam before, Having a feel for what the environment is going to be is going to get a, a huge stress load off of you before you walk into the room. Uh, you're able to flag questions. They take you through the question part itself. So here are the type of questions you may be asked on your exam. You will get multiple choice questions. Well, we knew that one. That's one that, we, of course, we're going to see. And you pick A, B, C, D, or E, or whatever it happens to be. You could also get fill in the blank questions. So this is one where you need to fill in the blank. Here's one where you're dragging and dropping with the questions. So these are performance-based questions. These aren't simulations, but you may be asked the question in a different way. Questions with exhibits. So it may pop open a screen and has a picture there, and you have to figure out what the question is based on the picture they're providing to you. That is one that you'll often see on the CompTIA exam. And what they say are performance-based questions, which might be a simulation exam. So they pop you down at a command prompt, and you're supposed to type in things associated with, with what's being asked of you. So that's what I mean when somebody says, what should I expect when I run into this? Notice that very little of this had anything to do with the command line. We have one example of that. The rest are matching and fill in the blank and putting things in a particular order. Um, that's easy. You know, it, it, it's not multiple choice. It's just different. And so these performance-based questions, don't be thrown by the term. One strategy that people have brought up is that on the CompTIA exams, you can jump back and forth between the different questions that are asked of you. This is not a linear exam that, uh, that will change based on what your answers are. Uh, some exams are like that. The Cisco exam, for instance, you start you at step one, and when you click go to the next question, you can't back up. But with CompTIA, you can back up, you can move around, you can click anywhere you want. You could start with the last question if you wanted to and work your way backwards. So one strategy that a lot of people consider is they will click on, click through the performance-based questions and get to the multiple choice and go through all the multiple choice and then go back to the performance-based questions. Well, obviously, time management is an issue. Most people feel, and they may be right or they may not be right, most people feel that the performance-based questions may be worth a large number of points. So answering the performance-based questions may be good, and not answering them may be very bad. You're trying to get over a certain number of points, and the only way to do that is if you answer the questions. Now, you obviously aren't. You don't have points taken away if you don't answer a question. 
uh, or you don't get points taken away if you get one wrong, or we just we don't believe you do. So you should try to answer as many things as you can. Uh, and the performance-based questions, matching or filling in the blank or whatever it happens to be, you should try to get through as many of those as you can. You should never get to the end of the 90 minutes and not have been able to answer all the questions. Take a stab at every single one of them. It's not going to hurt you to at least guess. And that's a pretty important consideration when you're working with these exams. So uh, the, the title of that video is Taking a CompTIA Exam. It is from the CompTIA um, CompTIA YouTube channel. So I got have it up here. So you should be able to easily find that on the YouTube just by doing that uh, that search for that piece of it. Uh, let's go back to our questions that we have. I just closed out my call status. There we go. Let's go back to our questions. Those performance-based questions. I think it throws people. I think it's more the fear of the unknown than anything else, don't you? being able to work with it. Um, and uh, um, the next question in was actually, what are some common si simulation questions for the exam? Well, if we knew, we wouldn't be able to tell you because CompTIA requires that you sign a candidate agreement when you start the exam. That is effectively a non-disclosure agreement as well. You can't discuss what you see on the exam. And it's not that you can't discuss certain things. You can't discuss anything. They are very, they're, it's a very blanket statement they make with their non-disclosure in the candidate agreement. And you have to agree to that to take the exam. So if somebody does know what common si simulation questions might be on the exam, they wouldn't be able to tell you. So it's a, that's a bit of a catch-22 there. But just have a look at the CompTIA video. You can get a feel. If you know everything in the exam objectives, you will pass your exam. So use your exam objectives as that master checklist. Go through each one of those things, and you do just fine. So let's uh, step through some more questions that we might have here. I need to move around some of the things on my screen so I can see all this room, and I can't see. I have, I have, I have like eight screens in front of me, and I can't find the thing I'm looking for. It's typical, isn't it? That's pretty much how, <laughs> how it works with those pieces. Uh, more questions from, from the registrations. Um, is there truly any secure way to have your data on the internet? It seems all security designs get hacked. Well, the answer is there are truly any secure way to have your data on the internet? No. Next question. Well, well, we'll fill that in, if you will. There are some very, very secure designs of networks, remarkably secure. Uh, but if you're connecting to the internet, it becomes a lot less secure. There's really no way to stop 100% of anyone who wants to get into a network. There isn't. There's so many different ways. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be with the internet. You throw a bunch of USB keys around a parking lot these days, and people take them inside and plug them into their computers. Thank you so much. You know, that, those are things you really have to be careful about. So it may not even be an internet uh, uh, attack or a vulnerability associated with connectivity, it may instead be as it, really your vulnerabilities are associated with people, people clicking things inside of their emails or bringing into the environment an infected machine and nobody knows that it's infected. These are constant issues. And although it seems all security designs get hacked, that's really not the case. We see some very high level security problems and some very um, in the news, some, some security issues that are always happening at some level to some companies, um, but they're not all vulnerable. You know, there are very specific things that may have been missed, and that's the real challenge, isn't it? That every single bit of your network is secure. You've secured your routers and your firewalls. You're up to date with your operating systems, but somebody forgot to click a button in the configuration of this one device that opened a hole that got someone in. That's all it takes. And that's the challenge. Um, it's not that these devices that we're using are any more or less secure than they need to be. In fact, most devices can be created to set up to be extremely secure. It's that we don't configure them that way. And again, that's more of that human element of trying to make that work that becomes the biggest problem with this. And I, I run into this all the time. As I mentioned, I was with a, a next generation firewall company for almost seven years um, and going through that startup process where you're trying to learn the technologies, work with the technologies, understand how people are implementing these firewalls. And some networks are 
I, I cannot give specifics because it, it'd be inappropriate, but some networks are just in horrible shape and probably are more susceptible to security problems than other networks I would walk into. It's just nature of the beast. You're going to run into some networks that are scary and some networks that are incredibly secure. And um, and you could tell where the biggest problems were on certain networks by what they were trying to accomplish. Sometimes, and unfortunately, we were brought in when a problem had already occurred. So they were really focusing on one part of the network and making sure that it would work properly. So that was one of one of those that uh, whenever I work with them that you, you always run into. Yes, we're into the after show now. The chat room's wondering, where'd all the questions go? Where's all the multiple choice? We're having such a good time. Well, it, it, takes, it takes me half a day to put together those questions. So we can only do so many. That first hour is the questions. We're now into the Q&A part of the study group. What are the most important protocols that I need to know for the Security Plus test? It, I get this question quite a bit. What are the most important things I need to know about this topic? What are the most important topics I need to know for my Security Plus? What are the things that are important for me to know before I walk into the room? So I am going to take you to a link, uh, professormesser.com slash objectives, which all it does is redirect you over to the CompTIA website. And you will be presented with this screen. And it's going to ask you to put in, at a minimum, your name, your email, and the exam objectives that you want. Go to this page and download the exam objectives. There's Security Plus. And you can do that. There are, there are also ways to do this inside of Google without having to go through this page. You can always contact me later if you'd like to know how to do that. If you're really good at Googling, if you know some special Google terms, you can find some of these things very, very quickly. Download this list of exam objectives. It's going to give you everything. Let me pull up my list of these exam objectives. I think I have them on my local drive, which makes this exceptionally easy. For the SY0401, I might not even have the latest version. I have version 4 here. Somebody can tell me if it's even the latest version. They make some minor changes to the exam objectives. As, as time goes on, usually they're spelling fixes or they're, they're changing some of the wording that they used. It very rarely changes the exam objectives to any substantial amount, but you should still make sure you have the latest version. You'll know that if you scroll down on the very first page, really every page, the footer will tell you what version number. They, they didn't used to put version numbers, so it's great that they do. The part that's important is right here. Starting in Domain 1.0, Network Security, implement security configuration parameters on network devices and other technologies. Firewalls, routers, switches, load balancers, proxies, web security gateways, VPN concentrators, NIDs and NIPs, behavior-based, signature-based, anomaly-based, heuristic, protocol analyzer, spam filter, <gasps> UTM security appliances, URL filter, content inspection, malware inspection, web application firewall versus network firewall, application-aware devices, firewalls, IPS, IDS, proxies. That's just the first section of the first domain. There's also section 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, and finally we're into section 2. That's a huge amount of information they're giving you. They're telling you everything you need to know for the exam. It would be silly not to download this and do something with it. So when somebody asks, what do I need to know about topic X for the exam, that's what you need to know right there. OK, so v7 is the latest for the Security Plus. And I probably have that version too. When I see a new version come out, I go and I compare and I contrast and see what they changed. Sometimes there's nothing in the exam objectives they changed. They added or they modified some of the acronyms at the end. So you'll have to look and see what are the differences between those. For the Security Plus, nothing is different from the time that they introduced the exam until what's available today. So you don't have to worry too much about that piece. And of course, if they do make a significant change to the exam, which rarely happens. It has not happened in many, many, many years with any of the CompTIA exams. But if they were to make a fundamental change to the exam objectives, I would, of course, update my videos, update my course notes, and make sure that all of you knew I was doing exactly that as well. All of the content for the courses on my website is up to date with everything. It's a great checklist. I, I agree in the chat room. Uh, it's a great way to, to prep what you're doing and to use this as a checklist. Because um, you know, if you know everything there, you're going to pass your exam. It's really that simple. Uh, to, I say that simple. You have to know all of that. The simple part is knowing what to know. The hard part is actually knowing it. So that's, that's the challenge. And it's, if you know what you need to know, you'll pass the exam. That was clear, wasn't it? Let's, let's continue on, shall we? 
Okay. Um, what are some sources to find updated information to keep security hardware slash software vulnerabilities from being exploited in the first place? Well, generally speaking, and this is sometimes not the best, but certainly one of the best, is the manufacturer of the technology. Almost every company that makes a device that connects to the network or an operating system that connects to the network has a set of pages that talks about security issues. So they may not advertise this page, but they may have a page like this. You may be able to, to Google around and find it pretty easily. So you can go to uh, manufacturer X slash vulnerabilities slash security slash something, and it will take you to a page of what the latest security problems are. That's really the best way to find out, am I up to date with software uh, and being able to work with it? I think that's that, that helps a lot when you're working along those lines and having that there. And that's, that's one of the best ways. If you really want to know, go to the source. Go to the manufacturer. They're going to have some of the best ways to tell you that something insecure is going on. Um, what are, where is... Where is best place to start as beginner to know about security? I think um, whenever you want to learn about security, you need to learn about the network. I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about hiring and certifications, that security has so much to do with the network. The more you know about the network, the better you're going to be in security. But of course, security isn't just about the network. The more you understand about operating systems, the better you're going to be with security. The more you know about programming and development, with different programming languages, the more you'll know about security. Just the challenge of understanding the difference between JavaScript and Java makes you a better security person. And actually, some people listening are like, there's a difference between JavaScript and Java? Oh, yes. An enormous, amazing, massive difference. But they sound so similar. I know. Why do we do this to ourselves? Another good example, there's, those, there's some very good uh, clearing houses of security concerns. And CERT is probably, it's already been put in the chat room, CERT is a great place to go for that. Um, uh, because that will that's really what we use. Whenever we find a vulnerability with a particular piece of software, we're often assigning certain numbers to it. And uh, one, one very common clearinghouse for this is to be able to look at uh, US CERT to be able to, to pull those up. So you can go to uh, uscert.gov for the United States computer emergency readiness team. And they, they have a nice list of the alerts that are out there. Um, this is one great clearinghouse because they're usually up to date and being able to do that as well for those pieces. Chat room's asking, are they, is this test online or in person? It's currently pretty much in person, I think, for the Security Plus. Uh, CompTIA was doing some exams uh, online. It's kind of creepy because they, they, they have you a camera and they make you view everything in the room. I think it was a third party that was really doing it for CompTIA and it was proctoring it. Uh, so they make you turn your camera in the room and, and down to your desk to make sure you're not using anything. As you're taking the exam, they're watching you in the camera. Uh, I don't know. Just maybe I'm, I'm just creeps me a little bit. Stop looking at me. I'm trying to take a test here. I know you're, I can't see that you're looking at me, but I know you are. Um, but they watch those things. I think the vast majority of what CompTIA does is at a testing center. I think what they ended up doing is using that technology for some very specific one-off cases where someone could not get to a facility um, for many different reasons, distance or just circumstance. Um, and and that's I think that's great that we have that technology, but they do not offer that for the Security Plus, the Network Plus, or the A Plus. You have to go to a CompTIA authorized testing center to be able to do that. And the testing centers have very specific requirements. This came up in a Reddit thread, I think, this week that was talking about they were taking the exam and something in the room was very loud. I think there was a, somebody else taking a different kind of exam where apparently they had to type a, a, an entire document. And they're typing and clacking. It's one of these keyboards that clack, 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 clack. And you're trying to take your exam. You're sitting there and you can't even think because somebody's clacking along. Another one said the people in the facility were standing there chatting. Hey, so how was your weekend? Oh, that was pretty good. How was your weekend? Really? I'm taking a test. And and you you are absolutely able to, if they're outside the door, to open the door and say, guys, I'm I'm like going crazy in here. Could you just maybe 
go over there and do something else because this is not working for me. And usually people that are in those facilities are fine with that. I've been in training centers where there are training rooms and they get out on break and they're standing around the hallway right outside the testing room. But they don't know it's the testing room because they don't usually work in that building. So you kind of have to poke your head out and go, I'm taking a test. Could you guys, I would, I would love all of you and get you cookies if you could go somewhere else for me because I'm trying to get through this exam. Um, and if ultimately you're having a problem, go to the proctor in the exam place. They have requirements to make sure that you are in a room that is clean, that is secure, that is uh, well um, conditioned, uh, the temperature is good, that is quiet. Um, and if it's not any of those things, they are outside the, the scope of the requirements and conditions set for that testing center. They're, they're very specific about this. CompTIA does not want you to have a bad experience. Nobody who's having, and trust me, CompTIA is paying money to these places to do this for them. They require that they be set up a certain way. So, and, and it's not a, uh, it's not a inexpensive thing for CompTIA to do. These are pretty expensive things. So they will make sure your testing experience is a good one. Yeah, you should never be in a situation where you fail an exam because one of those things wasn't right. You should stop it right then, address it immediately. Don't wait until your exam is over and you've passed or failed and say, well, you know, it's kind of it's kind of loud and I couldn't hear any. It's too late. You have to say right then, get up, walk out and say, I, I can't concentrate in here. We have to do something about this. Can I come back later? Can we do something? And they will have to figure out how to resolve this problem for you and, and make that happen. So, well, we do have somebody who was nice enough to call today. We have the, On the call, we have the 240 area code. Are you there? Caller, what's your name? Hi, my name is Kwafi. Uh, uh, I'm calling from uh, Silver Spring in uh, Maryland. Thanks, Kwafi. Thanks for calling. Well, what can we do for you today? Uh, uh, yes, um, uh, I'm, I want us to uh, talk about... Uh, the Sarbanes uh, Oxley Act, uh, Gramlich uh, Bly Act, and uh, PTIDSS. Okay. Uh, I am currently studying. I am currently studying for my um, CISSP exams, and when 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 I go through your uh, Security Plus uh, 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 videos, uh, you briefly touch on a uh, uh, soft uh, GLB and yep. PTIDSS. Yep. Um, I would like to look at most of the jobs online. Uh, they want someone who has uh, some knowledge of uh, South um, GLB and PCI DSS. And uh, uh, when I go online and take a look at uh, at these uh, uh, documents, they are, they are pretty huge. Um, <laughs> they are very huge. <laughs> I, yes, they are pretty huge. And I, I, I don't know uh, uh, which part of these uh, regulatory laws or guidelines it, it, it pertains to the, 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 the security analyst. Uh, could you briefly uh, 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 explain uh, uh, to those of us who are listening to you right now and those who will certainly be listening uh, uh, on YouTube uh, in the next uh, coming days, uh, what is SOX, GLB, PCI, DSS, and which part of these regulatory laws and guidelines really pertains uh, to uh, 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 the security analyst or some of us who are aspiring to get into uh, 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 information security. You have really hit on one of the biggest challenges for the security professional these days, and that is these uh, these compliance standards that are not just suggestions on how your network and your security should be designed. They are, in some cases, federally mandated or internationally mandated by the organizations that are associated with these particular pieces of data or these particular functions. So you mentioned SOX, which is stands for Sarbanes-Oxley. If you're in a conversation, somebody's saying, tell me what you know about SOX compliance. They're not talking about your shoes. They're talking about Sarbanes-Oxley, which is an investor protection act that was designed to protect financial information 
from getting out and and being misused. Uh, There's a similar one for medical environments. If you're working at a hospital or a doctor's office or these days, just your person walking around, you almost always know about HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And then there's uh, the the GLBA, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999. And and, And you also mentioned PCI DSS, which is the payment card industry, PCI. They have their own set of standards that if you are someone who stores credit card numbers, you have to also have a completely set of... Uh, a different set of things that your network and your security must comply with. So the question was an absolutely valid one, which was how, uh, as a security professional, what in the world am I supposed to know about these things? And unfortunately, one of the things that you have to know as a security professional is almost all of these things. But of course, as you've already mentioned, you were you were smart enough to go, let's look at the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Let's look at this law that was integrated and see what all of the different requirements are. Or, or uh, heaven for Finn, you're having to read through the PCI DSS requirements, which are huge. And they, en- they envelop how you write applications, what type of equipment that you put on your network. Um, and this is one of the things that becomes a challenge. You, uh, there are people in my industry who have to go to seminars and training sessions to get trained on what they need to know to be able to protect their network if they're handling credit card numbers or if they're handling patient data or if they're handling Sarbanes-Oxley financial information. All of these things become an enormous set of overhead and requirements for the security group. And I can't say that there's any one person out there who knows everything because these are so all-encompassing. There's probably a few people. There's a handful of people in the world who can probably tell you everything about everything you need to know about these particular compliance requirements. It is not a very good thing. But if you are in an environment where you have to be able to know this, you're almost always going to some third-party training because that's the only way you're going to get the knowledge you need. Otherwise, you walk into a hospital as a security professional what do you protect? How do you protect it? Is data that's sitting on a disk, is it required that it be encrypted? Um, for the the PCI DSS, one of the requirements is that you have a web application firewall, a WAF, which is different than the traditional firewall, the network-based or application aware firewall that you may be working with. And it says you have to have them, but it doesn't say how you have to, have to use them and configure them. So there's a set of audits, auditors, people walk in with their laptops who sit on your network to see now that you have all of these things that you're supposed to be in compliance with, did you really set it up properly? And they'll run tests, they'll run vulnerability checks, they'll look at the configuration of your web application firewall and everything else that you have, and they'll try to see if you are compliant with that. So The difficult answer here is if you have to manage a network that has to comply with any of these specifications, you as a security professional need to learn as much as you can about them. And it's often going to be something where you're reading documents, you're going to specific training, you're working with auditors, and I guarantee you're not going to pass the first audit. You're going to have to come back, fix things, and then have another audit again because it is an incredibly complex set of requirements that in some cases is vague enough that different auditors look at things in different ways, which is definitely not what you want. But that's one of the challenges you run into when it's this complicated. So I think you're right. You looked at the documents, you went through some of these details, and you realized this is enormous, uh, and you're right. Uh, in some cases, in some security environments, there is a person in the security group whose only job is associated with making sure everything remains in compliance. That's how involved and difficult it is to know these things. But I think the vast majority of security professionals have at least a a tertiary or a very basic knowledge of some of the things that are important. And they're relying on the experts in their organization to make sure when they implement a new piece of technology that it is in compliance with everything else. You almost have your own set of auditors in in your organization, as crazy as that sounds. Does that help? Make sense? Yeah, yeah that, that does uh, make some sense. But when I read, read uh, I did print out uh, the service of the law, uh, SOX, and I, I briefly went through it, and uh, it states that the United States Congress uh, 
uh, enacted uh, SOX in uh, 2002 yep. uh, in response to a, a number of uh, corporate and uh, accounting uh, scandals, notably that from Enron and, and Wellcome. And one of the stipulations of this law is that the CEOs and the CFOs, the chief financial officers, uh, have to uh, bear responsibility for the accuracy of, of, of financial statements. How does this relate to security? Some of it does not. Uh, in fact, if you look at... Um at the SOX is a really good example of this because the vast majority of SOX is process and procedure of how how the numbers are handled, who is told what about finances, um, who is responsible for signing off on the financial disclosures that an organization is making, and it's effectively setting up liability of individuals that they are verifying that the information that they're telling the public and they're telling the stock market is actually accurate, which has very little to do with a network security requirement. But where it does fit in, where the overlap is, is that this also requires that this information remain private to the company and that there are certain safeguards in place so that other people can't gain access to this data. So for SOX, there's a little bit of security overlap. You will see a much larger security overlap with something like HIPAA, which is incredibly focused on network and information security because it's all about keeping people's medical information private and these days all of that medical information is digital uh, you also see a big emphasis if you were to look at pci dss is another one that's practically all associated with network and it security because very little of that is process and procedure of how you handle the credit cards it's more about how you secure the credit card information that you are gathering so i, I agree with you Sox has a, a relatively speaking a little bit of network security sprinkled in there, whereas some of the other specifications, requirements, um, and and compliance issues are very focused on network security. I don't think you're off the mark there. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, you. You really uh, hit the nail uh, hard on, on, on the point. And uh, now let's let's talk about uh, uh, FISMA, which is the Federal Information Security Management Act. Uh, and, and the NIST uh, 800 series, as well as uh, ISO IEC 27,000 uh, 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 series. Uh, could could you briefly, uh, just briefly, uh, uh, talk about uh, these guidelines or uh, as they relate uh, to uh, uh, what does the security professional really needs to know about this? This is uh, dealing specifically with information security in the federal government. That's where you see FISMA being used the most. And a lot of it focuses around uh, the, the national defense and homeland security of what we're doing, because usually that's where the most private of data is going back between federal organizations and other types of organizations. And FISMA has three different scopes that they deal with. One is about how you handle the data and there's obviously a big a big IT focus there. And, and for the federal government, it deals a lot with encryption and security and making sure the information remains quiet. Um, there's also uh, parts of FISMA that talk about how do you know if you've set these things up so that you can keep things safe. So there's a, a benchmarking or a security posture analysis that you can use based on the requirements that have been put together. Uh, and some of it is not IT-based. Some of it is more going into an agency and again, this is federal government in the United States, and really talking with somebody specifically about how are things set up and doing the auditing of what's there. You rarely see FISMA brought up, obviously, outside of the federal government of the United States. And um, and it, I, I guess it goes without saying, the federal government of the U.S. and probably most governments have a particular way of doing things. And what they've tried to do with FISMA is take that that very standard way that they're using to protect data and encrypt information and keep things safe and put it into a compliance form that now every single one of the federal organizations must comply to regardless of who it is. I mean, even if you're the Smithsonian 
uh, and you're not really dealing with a lot of very detailed security information, you still have the same requirements as you do if you go to the FBI, the CIA, uh, armed forces, and other other standards. They, they tried to create a, a baseline that everybody can comply with because once you're into one part of the network, you can sometimes get to other parts of it. You don't often, as I mentioned, see that outside of uh, out of D.C. or outside of the federal government, but it's uh, it's certainly more of a IT requirement than something like SOX might be because it really is focused, uh, FISMA is really focused on protecting data and keeping information safe. Okay, um, uh, just, I, I don't want to monopolize uh, the airwaves. Um, just just one, 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 one quick question. Sure. Uh, there, there was the uh, OPM breach, data breach, uh, yes. uh, Office of Personnel Management. Uh, 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 that was announced uh, while I was working for the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, I was not involved. Uh, and, uh, okay. Uh, with the Office of Personnel uh, Management data breach, uh, 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 can we say that because there was a mention that uh, uh, the data that was infiltrated was not uh, encrypted at rest? So, so could, could, uh, if I'm suggesting that uh, the Office of Personnel Management did not follow some guidelines uh, 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 as outlined in a uh, am I correct? You, you are talking to someone who is probably the least knowledgeable with FISMA that, that you will find in security because I had nothing to do with federal government when I was in the security realm. I almost always worked with PCI DSS and HIPAA type environments because that's usually who my customers were. But if there's part of FISMA that talks about data at rest of these kinds must always be encrypted, then there should be a relatively straightforward decision made. Well, the data was not encrypted when it was at rest. Therefore, they were not in compliance. Um, you will find, though, it's I, I don't know that that's part of FISMA. Uh, having every bit of data encrypted when you're storing it somewhere is extremely difficult to manage. Um, there are so, so many challenges associated with that, dealing with uh, decryption keys, uh, being able to run normal analysis of the data. There's significant overhead if you're trying to encrypt and decrypt data as you're pulling it in and out of a particular database. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And and speaking as someone who is, knows nothing about the intricacies of FISMA, I can tell you that it w that would be remarkable if everybody, if every single part of the United States government were, were required to encrypt data at rest that had some type of PII associated with it. That would be a massive undertaking. I would think I would have heard of that one, but it's entirely possible because I'm not in that. There's a whole different realm of people that deal with that science of federal government, and I'm not in that realm. I've made specific decisions not to get involved with that particular piece of it because when you're in there, there's tons of things you have to keep in mind, and it's a completely different way of working. So if they if that is in FISMA and they did not have that data encrypted, absolutely they would have been out of compliance for that particular piece. I, uh, it'd be very interesting to see, to drill down into that, spend some time to know, is that really the case? Is that part of the requirement? It, could it be conceived as part of the requirement? And it will be even in, more interesting to see, will it become part of the requirement based on the type of data that got out that now is about 18 million people that were affected by this? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, th thank you for uh, for um, for your perspective on on these issues uh, because these issues are really complicated. And for those of us who still, who just look, looking to get into security, uh, it, it becomes a tough uh, thing uh, to really uh, assimilate all, all all this information. And and, and just I just want to get you, your uh, opinion on it. Looks like every week, every two weeks, every month, there is data breach. The Sony hacking, so, uh, target data breach, Home Depot, yeah. Office of Personnel Management, yeah. the IRS, uh, the White House, the, the, uh, the, the Department of Defense. Yep. It, it, what is going on? It, are hackers becoming more intelligent than the security professionals? So what is what what in the world is really happening? It, it's it is about moving, it's moving the bar around, and it's about 
what this information is worth. Uh, it's a combination of different things. And you're right, it does seem like we're hearing about a lot of these breaches, very large breaches, because obviously there's very small breaches going on all the time. But we're hearing about some massive ones dealing with millions of people, millions of card numbers, an amazing amount of detail. And that's because this information is so valuable. And we we have already we've created this technology that is able to store large amounts of information, to process large amounts of information, to uh, to work with these huge databases, and we're allowing companies to store this information. In some cases, they need to store this information to be able to perform the tasks tasks that we would like them to perform for us. But there has never been any type of oversight to determine how people protect this information. We're only just adding that in. PCI DSS is a relatively new thing to come into credit card numbers um, when you look at how long we've been using credit cards and how long we've had computers. Uh, HIPAA is another one. We've had to create these compliance requirements to protect this data because the data got out and we realized nobody's protecting this and there's no requirement for people to protect this. It's It costs money to have these systems in place to uh, to watch what's going on and to have all of this data here. And here to, to, to your question specifically is that we've put in place next generation firewalls, intrusion prevention system, web application firewalls. We are able to look at traffic uh, with uh, DLP, data loss prevention devices. We have heuristics machines on our networks that are looking for things that are unusual. We've added all this technology onto our networks and yet we're still getting breaches. And that's because the bad guys, when they find out you have a next-gen firewall, people have put in web application firewalls, intrusion detection, antivirus, anti-malware, they're instead finding other ways around them. So they're going to your email. Well, email's still open. I'm going to go to your email inbox and make you click on something. Facebook is still available. If you're in a federal government, uh, you may or may not have access to Facebook or Twitter or whatever the social media is. I'm going to put a link there and make someone click on it. And what they're doing is finding ways around your existing security methods, and it's going straight through and hitting the person's workstation. And once they're inside the environment, they can now start hopping around to other places. And then eventually, we will make the workstations more secure. There are new technologies out right now that are, that are working hard to do that. And as soon as we solve that particular problem, they're going to find another hole somewhere to get into the environment as well. It was uh, a, a recent one and in, in recent times was when they showed up at the Pentagon and just threw USB keys on the ground and got into the Pentagon. So sometimes it's not even that hard. Now, of course, the Pentagon then closed down everybody's USB ports. You can't use a USB port anymore for, for your USB storage because that's such an enormous concern. So uh, it's not that it's it's not that our systems are less secure than they've ever been. It's just the bad guys are finding this data is more valuable than it's ever been. And if they can get their hands on it and they now have Bitcoin and other ways to sell this information that is completely untraceable and they're able to, to bring up these, uh, these very comprehensive websites on the dark web where I could log on right now, uh, go to a particular zip code, uh, ask for uh, American Express cards that are gold cards in this zip code. Give me 10 of those, and I can buy them right now and have them in my hands. That is why this is becoming such a constant turnover of events is because this information it has a dollar value associated with it that they're able to get their hands on and do something with. And the faster we're able to understand that and put in our own compliance then I think we're going to be better off as far as, this, as the security is concerned. And it's constant vigilance and constant analysis and constant auditing to make sure that these things don't happen. And there's just no single right answer to solve the problem. It's one that is a constant battle that we're just all going to have to keep our eyes open. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And I would appreciate if you could uh, uh, just find some time uh, during one of these videos and uh, really step through uh, socks as it relates to security, PCI DSS, HIPAA, uh, and, 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 and the rest, uh, so that some of us could really uh, grasp uh, everything, uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the essential aspects of it. And I really thank you for taking time to answer my questions. And thank you so much for what you're doing to those of us who can afford uh, 
to pay for this expensive uh, online uh, tutorial. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. There is, uh, and you're right. I think that's a great recommendation is to put together a, a set of videos around some of these requirements. I could just go to the CISSP requirements and pull off that list, uh, and there would be an enormous amount of data to go through. This is one where the entire industry, uh, not just federal government and and the folks that are up in the, the D.C. area, but all across the world struggles with these problems. Um, even people you wouldn't think, you walk into a college and you think they're most concerned about uh, making sure that their educational information is secure. And in fact, they're saying we have a huge PCI DSS issue because they're taking credit card numbers of students. And they're storing that credit card information and they're sending it off to a credit card processor. You know, you don't even think about these. It becomes so pervasive in what we're working with. Um, and it would be very valuable to have those. I, I agree. I think it's an excellent recommendation. I think thank you for, for calling and doing that. I'm always open for suggestions for other videos. And that one is certainly in my wheelhouse. I certainly have seen enough of those to 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 know that that's the problem. Yeah, CISSP, for those in the chat room, uh, see, he was mentioning that on the call, um, is a is a pretty, uh, that's, that's kind of the highest in security certification. When somebody's going for a security job, you're looking to see if they have a CISSP. Um, they, that means they've been in the industry for a number of years because it requires that you have a certain number of years experience just to sit to take the exam. And then the information on the exam is very broad. Uh, it's very process oriented. You have to know about things like the uh, the requirements uh, of SOX and HIPAA and PCI DSS and all those abbreviations that we love to use in the security world. And you also have to be sponsored by someone who already has a CISSP certification. So we're not just going to allow anybody to sit for the exam. It has to be at least somebody personally, or at least that you know from an acquaintance perspective that understands that you're someone who is eligible to sit for the exam. So it's, a, it's, well, um, it's well regarded in the security industry. It's one that a lot of people will look for. But you don't have to. I, I was at a, a firewall startup, um, uh, and we were very successful. We went to, to nothing, to being a public company, and I didn't have any of those. Well, I had a Security Plus at the time. Um, so I didn't have a CISSP or those pieces, but I'd been in the industry and been working at the security level for so long and wrote a book on NMAP. And so a lot of the other things that you can do can help you when you're trying to solve a particular gap that might be on your resume. Um, so if you don't have experience, do other things. Find other ways that you could provide a potential employer with ways that make you valuable and that you know some of the things you're doing and that you have a passion for that particular particular thing that you're interviewing for. I think that's important as well. Okay. Um, well, that was, that was an excellent call uh, because it killed a lot of time. And he got to talk some, so I got to drink a warm beverage. But my voice is, is doing pretty well. We've come up on the second hour, so I think that's probably as good a time as any to uh to consider uh breaking down uh the studio for the next one of these i think there's a, as i mentioned um the next security plus do i have it here yes september 23rd so if you'd like to join us for my live q a you're watching this on the replay and you can't participate and you, you can't push the buttons on socrative and see how you do we welcome to join us live it's at noon eastern time on September the 23rd. And of course, I have an A plus study group. I have a network plus study group. You're more than welcome to join me for those as well, where we have a lot of different topics to go through for all of those different certifications. And we try to have a good time. And I open up the phone lines at the end of all those for open calls as well. And you can, of course, call in about anything, not just the topic that we're going through that day. I want to thank everybody for joining me. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for uh, the things that you do in the chat room and being there live. We wouldn't be able to do this if it was just me and there were zero votes coming in for the questions. So thanks so much for joining me live. We'll see you next month on the study group. Thanks, everyone.